Where I'm in the video? I'm recording video again. Oh, okay. Is that cool? So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Do you live in this neighborhood or in Oakland or what? I currently reside in a apartment mm -hmm. in Petrero Hill. Oh, okay. And I'm only <laughs> only there for a maximum of two months, it, oh, okay. it appears currently. Oh. You're choosing your words so carefully, Jared. Well, I'm choosing my words carefully because I'm mm -hmm. wishing to accurately represent to you okay. how I relate to my own experience. Okay. And you're going through an intentional process of mm -hmm. transformation. Uh -huh. Words are a tool. Yeah. It's I'm good to be intentional about it. Totally transforming every moment. Dude, I hear that. Helps me, actually. I haven't thought of it from that perspective. I really appreciate that. No, I was just repeating back what you said to me. Uh, well, so. you said transformation every moment. Why do you say that? How are words a tool for transformation from your perspective? Oh, I mean, because our thought patterns are mirrored in every moment of circuitry. So as you start to influence your thought pattern, which is ah. you know, affected by what you said, your circuitry changes. Totally. So this is this is why I, I tend to talk about like surfing the mimetic wave that comes out. Like I feel into my emotional experience and I can literally see myself descending recursively into my inner space. Mm -hmm. And I express and verbalize whatever I surf as I descend into my emotional experience. Sure. Mm -hmm. And and I try, try, I don't know if I try, but my intention is to... Um, create every moment like whatever I'm saying now I've never said before mm -hmm. I'm drafting like I'm not using anything from the I'm using everything from the past but it's also new in every moment mm -hmm. and so that way I'm really feeling and being here in this moment as I speak in every moment I'm so proud of you I feel like um yeah when I was taking improv and acting classes yeah. it was like and then I came out of that like I used to be really terrified of networking very like Okay, like, and like at my TV at these career fairs, I guess at every college, and I'd be like terrified of like that someone would ask me something about myself that I didn't know or something. I don't know what I was so terrified of. I can't remember. But it was very terrifying to go to these career fairs and be like, mm -hmm. they'd be like, oh, what are you going to do, you know, for the rest of your life? Like, we want to work for us. Like, what are you interested in for your future? And well, because like, they're putting a, they're putting your future in a gigantic rigid box. That's it very was, scary. It was very... Um, and they're narrativizing you in this yeah. mimetic pool where everybody's practicing this idea that this is the thing to value and this is the only way to be. Yeah. So whatever you're feeling, whatever it might be, maybe there's something that's not okay, that's not good. Yeah. That's so, one thing you might have been experiencing anxiety around. Anyway. So, like, I did, I went, uh, I went, after graduation, I moved to Chicago for, like, a couple of years and, like, studied improv and acting there. And in it Chicago, was... Cool. In Chicago. I loved it. Oh, my God. And... Uh, I took Meisner classes, which mm -hmm. are very, like, like, they just, I'm like, I got into the class, and I'm like, all right. And they're like, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, just uh, look at this person and tell me uh, what, you, you know, what emotional behavior you see. Just, like, just tell me, you know, just just every every second, you know, just tell me what it is. I'm just like, uh, I don't see anything. And they're like, you do. And then it's like they really shove it down your throat that you have these instincts, and they're talking to you all the time about what someone else what your instincts about anything you you like they really drive it home that you always have a, a perspective a point of view a thing that your instincts are saying that you are just for some reason suppressing or you know not aware of or something and I think so it was really hard for me in that class but like since then did and you then learn I, and integrate that perspective I think I did to some extent I I I think you I must have they accidentally think you did. they act like I think they, they really, uh, they really brutally trained me into to something. But I, when I went went back to Boston, when I moved back to Boston for like, you know, anyone I had to talk to about my career, even though I was more unsure than ever about my career because I just quit my my trading job at that point, and I was like, I have no idea what's next. But it was so easy to talk to anyone about anything. It was just like, you know, just because it was like. I was accidentally reading their emotional behavior like the entire time and just kind of like it felt like a wall of water it was like oh this person needs more from me right now because they don't understand what my job was or they don't understand something and it was just like as long it was just playing this game of like keeping the wall of water from the other person like steady or engaged or whatever I wanted it to be and it was just kind of like 
And if you, then I'd play with like, like throwing really crazy stuff out there. Like I'd start talking about this yoga to like science people and watch their eyes like glaze over. And then I'd play a game of like trying to get them back, like get them back on my side. And it, it's like, so I, that kind of like characterizes the way I talk now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't. To your awareness. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't, uh, I don't try to. I'm really bad at giving like just like signposts and things like that because I'm literally just speaking like whatever I whatever I think the person needs to hear in order to or whatever I want to say but also like you know in the way that the person needs to hear it like it feels like there's some dip, dimple in the wall of water because I didn't explain it enough like here or something so it's like oh well let me fill that in for you I see that you're confused because I didn't you know but I never say it. So it's like that. So it felt like that Meisner class feels kind of like reality surfing, I guess. It's like it trains the muscle for mm -hmm. you to even know where the. Sure. It is. So um, I used That's to. That's 100% just... true. I, I directed film and theater for many years mm -hmm. and I've studied these techniques. Yeah. And these are real techniques yeah. that map onto real human experience mm -hmm. that are incredibly empowering. Yeah. They're not actor tools. They're not just actor tools. Yeah, I was the only non -actor. And they are actor tools. But an a yeah. like one early realization for me was that this was senior year of college, I think, or maybe junior year, that there's no such thing as, well, there is such a thing as acting. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to look good on camera or in a theater. Right. The only thing is being. Mm -hmm. there's no, don't act, yeah. just be. Mm -hmm. And these are tools to help one realize how to be sure. whatever it is that they are trying to play. Yeah. So these are very much real. Mm -hmm. They have everything to do with emotional intelligence, basically, and self-awareness and, and like, empowerment. Yeah. That's why I love all these new technologies that people are making, like the Muse mm -hmm. and, like, all of these devices. So, mm -hmm. you know, it is, it's the ability to, instead of constantly fracturing our attention externally, mm -hmm. to take a little bit of that with mm -hmm. the gadgets that we love and, mm -hmm. like, bring it back, right? Because, yeah, we are fragmented. And in our fragmentation of attention, we are also allowing the earth itself to become fragmented. It's coming apart at the seams. And so if we're not able to become a, a holistic kind of perception within ourselves, then we won't be able to perceive that outside of us. May I offer a, another choice of narrativizing what you just said that may bring us greater more into alignment with that future that you seem to value where we are harmoniously um life, life. Yeah. uh you said we are fragmented so what this tends to mean to people psychologically based on how they represent themselves and their relationship to the world and their views on reality and their, in other words their beliefs right. is that and i'm not accusing you of this but it's just something to be mindful of sure. is when people say we are fragmented they're putting, we're putting ourselves in a box called state, and this is the way we believe ourselves to be. And as long as we believe that we are this way, it may be more and more difficult for us to realize that we are also some other way, or greater than that, or whatever. So I speak very, and I'm just offering this as, because you might say we are fragmented, or some of us are fragmented, or many of us are fragmented currently. And how interesting, now I'm realizing the word current because the now that is current is the wave at this locus of unity that we are all surfing together and we can all very clearly observe that we are in a kind of flow as long as we can be fully present in the now and currently when I language myself that way allows me to observe the frame of the box that I'm otherwise limiting myself to with my narration. So if I said, we, this is how I think of it. If I say, I am fragmented, then I'm not, a, I'm not practicing an awareness and observation of the frame that I'm putting myself in by saying that. So by saying, I am fragmented currently, that means I'm practicing an awareness and I'm observing through my language and my at the level of the most abstract level of my mind you might even say which is language but I don't, it's not necessarily just abstract I'm practicing an observation and even a public observation and awareness with that with equanimity is my intention anyway of the frame that I'm putting myself in in my thought construct that is what I think reality is and how I am
be careful about the framing of things verbally because it limits potentially what we're able to manifest mm -hmm. what is exactly i think that's that's fair i mean is that yeah. up to you to decide whether it's fair no i mean i think that <laughs> it's something that i, I resonate with in some okay way, in i see what way. you're saying i think what is what is equally true is that language can be used to put people in boxes which then cause them to take certain steps which are then kind of planned so for example like the super negative example well, we'll start with the positive example of this would be you know you are uh, in your in a 12-step program for example right you kind of have to they put you in this box of oh you are um, you are sort of wounded in a way and you have to kind of be aware of that and come to terms with it and speak that truth to yourself and other people and it's only out of that framework that you then move towards wholeness and so that narrative of we are here and then we have to go here helps some people to get where they go i think mm -hmm. it can equally be applied to like propaganda you know like mm -hmm. for example in germany totally world war ii you know oh, we, it's, it's a fearful situation that we're in we have to do this to get out of it like mm -hmm. fear motivates people language is a technology that can be used for good or bad depending on one's goals and context it's just a technology not just it's also a part of the inter infinite integral of who everything is or whatever but like and and a further question would be is there such a thing as good or bad and as long as we believe there is such a thing as good or bad can we realize ourselves as the infinity that we are or something like that but let's just say there's a good and bad that's fair for a second mm -hmm. then yeah language can be it's like people say oh if you do an ayahuasca ceremony or a mushroom trip people can cast a spell on you mm -hmm. or people talk about like a bad trip as though it's a bad trip well, in my experience of having bad trips i'm really grateful i had bad trips because mm -hmm. when i allowed myself to go all the way into it and get to the bottom of it i was able to step out i really finally confronted the fear that that was this massive meta pattern thought that i was like in this frame that i believed was who i was and if i would get out of it then i would be dead right that's what transformation is all about and once i finally get to the bottom of this thing that i'm so afraid of and i think is bad mm -hmm. and i have so much pain in relation to as long as i resist it with aversion once i get to the bottom of it and i descend all the way down this meta pattern recursively or maybe I go all the way up meta, either way, then I'm at the bottom and I finally look at the reality of what is. And I come back and I say, oh, that was a thing that I was inside of, this frame in which I swam. And I'm still here. I'm alive. Like, but I didn't get to realize that if I tried to avoid the bad trip. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we use language to call things good or bad, I would say also is a meta issue that we might observe. Um, but yeah, certainly a technology can be used for whatever your goals are. Of course, yeah. That, I mean, I guess on some level, I discount the verbal technology because it feels... That's what I'm feeling from you. Yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, that's my own basis, I'm, my own bent. I'm like, oh, well, this is happening in our body, in our brain. So let's, rather than using words, which are, like, how many words have I read? I'm like, there's so many books. I've read so many books. I travel all over the world, like, searching for texts and everything, mm -hmm. you know. Do you want to know? Can I, can I share something? Oh, go, go ahead. Go. That was just my ego thought, Yeah, it was, it's just... Ultimately, these are pointing towards a state of experiential being in the moment, which has nothing to do with words. Mm -hmm. And words are such a tiny part of even our brain, much less the larger reality. So uh, I'm so interested in getting into that experiential state mm -hmm. and to do it in a nonverbal way so that everyone can kind of feel it rather than mm -hmm. have to think or understand it. You want to go take a pole dancing class tonight? Yes. Great. Let's go. Damn it. Eight o'clock. Damn it, Jared. You do this to me every time. It's, it's, on video. it's, not, to, it's recorded on video, too. No, yeah. there's no commitment. Would you like to set an intention? It's non-binding. Where, where is this class? It's in Marina. I think you can get in. I'm so supposed to be... I'm, I've agreed to film part of it. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm going to ask I'm her... I'm going to go ahead and say no to that. <laughs> oh, no, no, you can leave. No, 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 hold on, hold on. Okay. Let's be sure here. Yes. The class is from 8 to 9. I will not be filming that class. Gotcha. I'm going to ask her, once I stop recording, if I can come and take the class, and then, at the end of it, 
film it. She wants to film just at nine o'clock for those who are open to being filmed. Sure. So the construct you believed was the future can be optimized against. And we can be back in the pole dancing class. I also have a nonverbal intention this year. It's like a meta intention. Realize myself nonverbally. But I just wish to say, as you have expressed, that you have some judgment of verbal mm -hmm. technology. That for me, mm -hmm. language has practically been everything. I know, I can see that. About mm -hmm. transformation and growth and healing. And without it, I'd be something else. Mm -hmm. All things are good in God's creation, you might say. I wish they were lit better when you said that, because that's a, that's a classic. All things are good in God's creation. <laughs> Who is God? Are we not God? I, I hesitate to use the word God a little bit because it seems like to externalize this thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like, in infinity, mm -hmm. everything is. Maybe that's a way of saying it. I haven't verbalized until now. In infinity, everything is. Does that make sense? So I'll say something about... Meaning there's no good or bad. So I'll say something about... Um, yeah, uh, so what I what I didn't say before about... So I, I talked a little bit about good hypnotists, and there are... Uh, there are hypnotists that like don't give you the same feeling as I'm gonna call them bad hypnotists, um, as if you just did yoga. So I I put my bar of like, oh, this is a healing art if it makes me feel like after I've experienced it, like I just did yoga in some way, you know, like like in that same sort of like centered and like you know flowy kind of way. So um, some hypnotists are really good. And some hypnotists are just kind of like, you know, they're doing the thing, the technology of like, you know, voice and verbal technology, you know, that, that stuff that's like, you know, people who, who put spells on you or whatever, all that verbal technology is, is real, but, and it all has power, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Can we shift over here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all that like verbal technology is real, um, is like this real power and stuff like that uh -huh. but um i i found that like for it to have any real like uh power that's like comparable to like doing yoga i think uh -huh. you actually need a hypnotist who is aligned himself like who's uh -huh. done like the best hypnotists i know are like insanely uh aligned themselves mm -hmm. like with some yes. that have been practicing some deep spiritual path for like nine years or something and yeah. then happen to also study hypnosis the, and help people that way the vibration is so strong like yeah they it's like out. i think it's that their intuition is so perfect that they know that like like they worked through on their intuition through other spiritual practices as well so like when it comes to hypnosis which like should be a healing art um and it it actually becomes like an, a way to heal other people through just communication because they're communicating exactly you know in hypnosis there's like anchors there's like you decide what the person needs and then you give it to them or like you hypnotize them of like you know by putting them into trance by these methods like confusing the mind a little bit and putting them into trance and then giving them these suggestions and you write up the suggestions and then you read them you know there's this whole thing where you do it and a bad hypnotist is just kind of like, you know, does the whole thing, but then you just kind of like come out of it and you're like, okay, well, I guess I got, you know, I guess I don't like cheese anymore or something for some weird reason. It's not integrated with who you are. It's not, it's just this random, you know, thing that got put into your brain while you were like, you know, allowing it in. Um, you know, a lot of marketing is just hypnosis. Like a lot of marketing is like, you know, just, just show a, a Pepsi in the hand of like a really hot girl, like, you know, enough times or like two, two hot people, like, and you, you get, um, you're socializing people. Yeah. But, um, you know, so there's like really like weak hypnosis and, but like the strongest and most beneficial kind of hypnosis I found is like by really like, you know, really, um, spiritually oriented and like clear channeled because I think it's like, you need to know what to, like what to say. So the verbal technology is very powerful. So you know, like storytelling is very powerful. 
all that stuff but it's like having a place from where to to draw the story as it's happening is like the most um is more important i think like than the technology is is ultimately like trumps the technology itself because um it's it's uh yeah so it's it's this I, i'm basically agreeing with what you were saying rohan in that um, yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of like, you know, sorcery and witchcraft, and there's all sorts of ways you can get yourself to change state into, you know, more alignment, more things. But um, there's a there's a core, core space, and like you have to actually be using the healing tools in that direction. Sure. So that's what I feel. I've never actually been to that place. Yeah. What is a hypnotist? Like uh, psychotherapists who does hypnosis, but has been certified for hypnosis. Ah. We used to study this at Stanford. One of my, mm -hmm. my colleagues was doing a lot of, we were really focused on meditation. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had a grant where they were also adding kind of hypnosis to that. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful yeah. thing. It's really interesting. I've okay. known several hypnotists um, in, in my life. And there's two really good ones who I know. One lives in like Pennsylvania. He was like the first like healer, like like serious healer hypnotist. Like I, I was like sitting behind him at a yoga retreat, and I actually like after about like ten days, he was he's my friend. I actually felt like with my eyes closed, I could set, I felt like he was like a human crystal or something. Is what like vibrating or something. It was like really so wonderful experience. to be around him. Yeah. Vibrations from crystal, you're saying? Oh yeah. Well, from meditating. Yeah. <laughs> I always forget to talk about that part. Um, yeah, like when you know, like just like people who have you know go on mushroom trips, sometimes they'll experience my vibrations from touching crystals. Um, definitely. I'm not familiar. From, from Can you could you tell me from your perspective? Yeah. Um, from well, when I was doing Kundalini. Can I just jump out real quick at a meta level? Yeah. One of the powers of language technology mm -hmm. that I have found that allows me empowerment and all of us, is that I can talk to anyone and learn their perspective such that I may integrate it into who I am. So I can talk to you. And I've never, I mean, I had a rock collection when I was younger, but I've never thought, I mean, I've, I'm aware that people use crystals. Mm -hmm. I've personally not had really the experience of doing it. But you can tell me your narrative and I can, yeah. I know how to ask you questions in such a way or you might just express it on your own. Yeah. That next time I see crystals, I know how to, I have a beginning of how to connect with them. <laughs> so it's actually like carnelian and quartz uh, wrapped in copper. Carnelian. So can you tell me about this a little bit? Yeah. Oh, so like I remember. Or how would I interact with it and what can we do with it? You can interact with it however you want. It's kind of like what I don't, I mean, I don't do like super, I don't have time to do like a ton of specific stuff with it. But I just really like touching it. Um, it just kind of feels like. Like this is like a particular, it's actually a wand. Like I bought this as, um, yeah, I bought this as a, just cause it was so novel. Like at, and it felt so good after this yoga retreat. I and mean, I can feel it now, but it's like much, I mean, after like a 10 day yoga retreat, I, I always feel like my hands are like these round, like light globe, so you know, I really wish we could measure it too, but like, it feels like that. And then you put a crystal in there and you're just like, oh my God, you know, it, it feels like there's a battery inside somehow. But there, you look and there's no battery. It's a, you know, it's a bunch of rocks. Right, but the there's, lattice structure holds energy. It, yeah, I mean, I don't know how it, how it works, but yeah, it's, it's like suddenly like it just feels like there's like a huge intense, like, it's, you know, intense vibration going through. And it's like, um, I didn't believe that. I, I heard of like other people talking about those sort of things but I was like listen I'm just doing yoga I don't want to talk about it like that sounds dumb and I used to discount all of that and then uh when I like felt like there when I picked up a crystal right after the yoga retreat for the, my first yoga retreat like four years ago or three years ago or something I felt so shocked that there were, it was like it felt like you know some sort of Harry Potter thing like in my hand that um after that, I decided to like just stop ever having the reaction of like someone has this had this mystical experience, uh, therefore they must be crazy or must be lying. I used to just actually have that like um, totally. that reaction to sure. I I 
to digit i mean i'm on the same i had i was the same way mm-hmm. so much so that i entered a contest to have where the prize was to have dinner with richard dawkins oh. and i won uh-huh. because no. i w- <laughs> Because I wanted to have dinner with Richard Dawkins uh-huh. because this is a guy, I was very militant atheist and I wanted to sit and have a conversation with one of the mm-hmm. most renowned intellects in the world if yeah. not, who's, right. who invented, coined the word meme for that matter and has the whole selfish gene perspective and all this, but also is the premier atheist, you know, and is yeah. known that way. So I was like, oh, I'd love. And during that phase, I was very dismissive of people's experiences. Yeah. And one of the things as I was studying neuroscience, actually, that kind of started bringing me around to it was... Mm-hmm. I said, well, the reality is these people are representing that they're having some experience. Yeah, yeah. So there, something emotionally is happening in them. Am I able to deny them 